Ever since Darwin, biologists have understood the importance of the tree of life metaphor. In Philomath, we will learn how to infer that tree and how to use it to understand biological processes. Philomath is made possible through a career grant from NSF, as well as ongoing support from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Today we're going to learn about methods for looking at discrete trait evolution. So what you want to understand by the end of this is some of the connections between these methods and how these methods work. And so in organizing a class like this, you can always organize things by sort of sets of questions, like biogeography or diversification, or you can organize it by the underlying approaches. And so what we're doing in these, these videos is organizing it by the approach, right? So this continuous time Markov chain in finite state space we're going to learn about today um, is a model that's used in looking at DNA evolution to infer trees, it's used to figure out essential states, it's used to figure out correlation between states, so it's actually used for a lot of different questions. Once you understand this basic method, you can use and apply that to different questions. In some ways, it's a lot like how we cook, right? So when you bake, you know, bread or pancakes, something like that, um, it's basically the same set of ingredients. Maybe it adds some extra sugar, maybe add some cocoa powder, that sort of thing. But the basic same set of ingredients that you combine slightly differently to get um, very different outcomes. So continuous time Markov chain and finite state space. Sounds like a mouthful. Right? What is it? So continuous time is something just, you know, we're not, we're not dividing time into discrete stages, you know, seconds or minutes or millions of years. We're dividing it, we're doing it a, a continuous process, right? So I can go, I can wait 10 seconds, I can wait 10.43 seconds, um, I can wait you know, 15.251 million years. Markov chain. So Markov chain is a collection of random variables where the future is dependent only on the current state. Right? So example, this is the kids game shoots and ladders. Right? So if you're on square 76, where you go next depends on just what, where that square is and what you roll. Right? It doesn't matter if you came there from going up the ladder and then down some chutes or just going along linearly along the, the matrix. All that matters is where you are at that point. Chess is typically similar to this, with a few exceptions, right? But like, where the knight can move next depends only on the current board. It doesn't depend on where the board was 10 moves ago. It doesn't depend on where the knight used to be. All that matters where the knight can move is where it is right now. Okay. Of course, not everything is Markovian. So um, some things are non-Markov, and they actually have a memory. Like, so here's one of my neighbor's houses. And so you can look to see, you know, if they're deciding to sell a house, they look at the previous times it's sold and say, okay, well, it was sold for this at this point, and then it was sold for this at this point, and, you know, you try to, you know, always sell it for more than you bought it for, right? And more than the previous owners bought it for. And so there's this memory of what the price has been through time that affects the price you set it at the moment. Um, an example of something that is Markovian is looking, is looking at you know, this sort of state space, right? Where I can go from state zero to state one, from one to two, and from two to zero. So if I'm at state zero, I can only go one direction. It doesn't matter how I got to that zero. Right? If I'm in state one, I can go to zero or I can go to two. Right? It doesn't matter if I got there from going you know, two to zero or so I've always been in one. What happens next just depends on where I am, right? So it's Markovian. Finite state space. So it seems we have this you know, small set of states. So DNA is a canonical example, right? A, T, G, or C. Or I could imagine a, a, a physiological trait, like woody or herbaceous, right? Um, I could imagine something like you know, an infection, infection disease model. So susceptible, infected, or recovered. I could do other traits like you know, herbivorous, omnivorous, carnivorous. I could do something that's countable. Right, zero, two, four, up to 100 legs. Right, so we have these finite states. You're this or this or this. And of course, biologically, some of this might seem a little iffy to you. Right, so herbivorous versus omnivorous versus carnivorous. Right, so if you're a bear, you're an omnivore. Okay, if you're a lion who occasionally eats, you know, some berries, are you a carnivore? So are you an omnivore? Right, and so oftentimes when you go from the complexity of this biology into these, you know, categories. There's some fuzziness involved, right? How much ligand do you have to have to be considered woody? Right? What about a uh, vine? What's that? You know, and questions like that. Um, 
So there's always that sort of ambiguity. And so when you're actually running, using your own data, you should think about, you know, do I, do I believe in these state assignments? If I change the threshold slightly to, you know, what, what counts as omnivory, does my entire model fall apart? Um, it's worth being cautious about that. But these models assume that once you have these states, you know, these are these bright lines between herbivorous, omnivorous, carnivorous, and so forth. That's sort of the central part of the models. So one cool example, one sort of good test case we could use for this is looking at Twinkies. Right? Everyone loves Twinkies. Um, so imagine I had a store, and I said in my store I have a probability for a given you know, package of, of Twinkies of them being bought by an adult, so 20% chance of the adult coming in and buying the box of Twinkies. 10% chance of a child coming in and buying the Twinkies, and 5% chance of someone coming in and stealing the Twinkies. Right. So it's probably the Twinkies leaving the store that day. So it's I could leave by being bought by an adult, or by being bought by a child, or by being stolen. So 0.2 plus 0.1 plus 0 0.05, 0 0.35. So 35% chance of it leaving the store that day. Right. If it does leave, it's probably it was paid for. So what we do is figure out all the, all the ways it can leave, right? And so that's 0.35, right? Because it's either going to be bought by an adult, by a kid, or stolen. And out of those, you know, 0.05 out of that 0.35 are stolen, right? So the problem it was paid for is 1 minus 1 seventh, or 6 sevenths. That's right? probably it was actually paid for. Okay. Other problem it stays in the store for at least two days. Well, it's probably it didn't leave the store the first day, because it probably didn't leave the store the second day, right? So probably it left the store was 0.35. It's probably not leaving the store is 1 minus that, so 0.65. Probably it stays for at least two days is 0.65 times 0.65, right? So just basic probability, you can think about the possible outcomes and figure out the probability given those outcomes. Okay. Now it's per day. I guess I'd do it per hour, per minute, per second, per million years um, by changing, by having a scaling factor and having my delta t. Okay? And of course, we can make that infinitesimally small to make it sort of continuous approach. Right? Okay, so that's what we do in file genetics. And so you can think of those as rates. Right? So change it over time, so probably over time. So I have, you know, our adult is just the rate at which it's bought by an adult. And I can expand that, right? So that's everything I was doing so far was thinking about leaving from the store to one of these other places, right? So to an adult, to a child, to a thief. So I can now have, you know, rate of going from a store to an adult, so it's an adult buying it, rate of it going from a store to a child, or rate of it going from the store to a thief. And of course, it, once it's, you know, held by an adult or a child or a thief, you can go somewhere else, too. So I can now fill these in. So I have a rate of it going from an adult back to the store, or the rate of an adult you know, giving a child the Twinkie, or that adult. <coughs> and so now I'm going to start to ask questions by looking at this rate matrix. So, for example, does the store ever get Twinkies back? So do people return Twinkies for a refund? And that relates to these three rates, right? So if this rate, rate of adult to store, is zero, then it means the adult never returns Twinkies to the store. If it's greater than zero, then that suggests the adult does return Twinkies. Right? So they can think of this as a model, is I have a possible zero of rate of going from something to store is set to zero. Right? So that means each of these be zero, or it's greater than zero. Right? And so I can test this by fitting a model where I have the rate, this rate, these rates all set to zero, and compare that to a model where I have these rates allowed to be greater than zero. Okay, see which model is better. Okay. I can think of other hypotheses to test with this. I could say, do adults give to kids at the same rate that kids give to adults? And again, here my model is, you know, my null model is the rate of going from child to adult is exactly the same as adult to child, so these would be set to be the same. Or I could allow them to be different, right? And you know, this rate could be two, this rate could be one. Okay. And so there's a lot of biological questions we can ask questions like that. One thing to think about, though, is, you know, are two biological rates ever exactly the same, right? So think about it in reality. It's, you know, let's assume the rates of going from adult to child is pretty similar to the reverse rate, right? But imagine if we could measure with infinite precision 
there be some difference. Right? So all these tests we do, so sort of tests for statistical significance, as biologists, you have to think about the biological significance. Right? Um, if the rate's 10% different, is that matter biological? In this method we'll talk about later to do you know, weighting of results across these different models, so you can get actually a good parameter estimate of these rates and see what those, given those parameter estimates, does it biologically make sense? And is it important? So that's Twinkies. Let's talk about something else. So here's a paper by Curry et al. came out in Nature, looking at human societal evolution, right? As they have a phylogeny of humans um, based on their language, and they have states for these different human societies. So they have acephalous societies, very, very simple societies, simple chiefdoms, complex chiefdoms, or states. Right? And so you imagine different ways of transitioning between those, those ways of being black, ways of structuring society. And so they test a variety of models of political evolution, right? And so you can see we go from you know, this model is acephalous, simple chiefdom to complex chiefdom to a state. That's one model. One model is we can go between any two neighboring um, complexity regions. I can maybe go between any two. I can always go back to become simpler, right? I can do giant leaps. I can do any transition I want, um, and so forth. And so we have all these different models. What do they actually mean? Well, we can just go back to our visual Twinkie example and just change the labels. Right? So rather than having these labels, we can make it these labels. Right? And again, we have well going from acephalous to simple chiefdom. Right? It's that rate right there. Or from acephalous to state, from there to there. Okay? So this very simple model, I've set this rate to zero. So I don't go from simple chiefdom to acephalous. Right? It's only going this way. So this rate is zero, and this rate is just that, right? I don't go from state to simple chiefdom, so the S to SC rate, S to SC, is also zero. All right, so I can constrain the model in this way, and now I've, ma I've made this model. Okay. I can create this model where you can go between neighboring complexities, right? Where I can go from A to SC, or from SC to CC, SC to CC, or the reverse, CC to SC. But I can't go from CC all the way back down to A in one step. I could go there by going here and here. That's fine. I can go here to here. And then once I'm here, I can go from here to here. That's OK. They're not instantaneous in one step. Or I can do a full model where I have all these rates, and they can all be you know, estimated at zero, estimated at higher rates than that. OK, and so then I can sort of see how these models look kind of complex initially, can think about how they would look in that rate matrix. Right? What you can do is then um, try different constraints of that rate matrix and then fit the data to that rate matrix. Okay, and they did this and they um, did a complex way of combining these different estimates from different rate matrices and found this was their overall best model, right? Where you had movements um, between neighboring complexities with some probability of jumps down from you know complex societies down to any level of simpler societies, right? So we can go from a state all the way down to acephalous, um, or a complex chiefdom all the way down to acephalous, with very, very tiny rates going this way. Okay, and so here you can see you know, these rates sort of categorized. So A to SC is medium, right? Um, SC to CC is pretty high, right? We've got the thickness of the arrows. Um, and the rates are very, very low. Okay. And that's the model for looking at um, resolution of a single trait. We do the same sort of model here for looking at correlation. So here we have this, we did, we did a study looking at play in primates. Um, and we have primates, some primates have sex play, some have social play, some have none, some have a mixture of one or the other, right? And so you can think about that as, you know, two binary states, sex play, no sex play and social play, no social play, right? Um, we can combine them into a single four-state character. So no, no is one state. Yes, yes is another state. No, yes is another state. Yes, no is another state. And the same, so we again, it's like the Twinkie example, we have four possible states, but here they are no sex, no social, no sex, yes social, rather than store, adult, thief, and so forth. So again, we can estimate this rate matrix. Right? And we can constrain it in various ways. And so a common way of constraining this is assuming you have to move 
um, one trait at a time. So I can't change the zero and the A in the same instant. I have to go this way or this way. Okay, so that's the way they constrain that, and they're making those entries zero. So I have this zero probability of going directly this way, but I can go around the, around the diamond. Okay, so there's our model again. And we should estimate these rates and try a variety of models, and then based on how well the model fit, we average those rates from the models, and we found sort of these sort of rates where we go from, if you think of going from like no sex play, no social play, to yes sex play, and no social play, it's actually faster rates to go this way than to go directly across, which is kind of interesting. And that sort of correlation test is, was first developed by Mark Pagel in 1994. Um, and there's various names to the test. I often call it just Pagel 94. But it's a way of looking at correlated character evolution. And exactly this sort of thing where you take this matrix and you constrain it in various ways. Um, you constrain, you know, they only go certain directions around the matrix, or I say the rate of going from A to B is higher if I'm in state zero than if I'm in state one, and various tests like that. And all these different tests, all these different names, are all just different ways of constra constraining this matrix. Right? Not to say that the test is trivial, it's a very, very important test, and it's used and it's cited hundreds of times already in a variety of cases, you know, primate evolution, frog evolution, um, uh, Asteraceae evolution, right? So, you know, plants, frogs, primates, doesn't matter. Um, it's used to look at human societal evolution, right? So it's a very, very useful approach, but it boils down to constraining this matrix in various ways. Okay. And there are many approaches that also boil down to just having this rate matrix, right? Um, so these are from an annual review article I wrote a few years ago. And so a nucleotide model, like the GTR model, is just a rate matrix where you constrain <coughs> the rate of going from A to G is the same as the rate of going from G to A. A juice cancer matrix, the simpler model, has the same rate everywhere. Right? Um, the Pagel 94 approach, binary correlation, is just a rate matrix that has some zeros in it and some other rates, and you can constrain it in various ways. A covariant model, um, I'm just showing A's and T's here, of course it goes out to G's and C's as well, is a model where you have um, some states being turned on, some states can be turned off, it's also possible. Um, so again, these, you know, we're showing a four by four matrix in each, each case, but of course it could be two by two, they could be eight by eight, they could be 64 by 64, um, they could be various sizes. Right? Um, you also have ordered transitions, right? So I can go from zero to one and from one to two, but I can't go from zero to two in one step. Right, and so you have this, so if you want to test a model like, like the Curry model of human evolution, human societal evolution, you can do constraints like this. Right, and the cool thing is all these different models and all these different questions have the same basic approach underneath. Just this rate matrix, and we just sort of constrain some ways to be equal, sets them to be zero, and then run your analysis. Okay, so we have this instantaneous rate matrix, we often call it Q, right, it's instantaneous rate going from A to B, A to C, and so forth. We want to figure out probabilities of change over a certain time. We just multiply that rate matrix by time. Right? So let's say over 1 million years, what do I expect? And then exponentiate that matrix. Right? And then I get my transition probability matrix. Right? So I go from my instantaneous rate matrix here in time to this probability matrix. So I can say, given that I start, you know, given that I start in A and I wait whatever T is, you know, 15 million years. I would probably be staying in A, or be remaining in A at the end, I would probably be being in B at the end, I would probably be being in C at the end, I would probably be being in D at the end, and so forth. Okay, so I can go from this rate matrix in time to this probability matrix. And that makes it really powerful. So here's a case from Felsenstein, and this is an example used for long bit detraction, but also used for understanding rate of evolution. So I have, imagine, you know, a simple trait, a binary trait, zeros and ones, and I use my rate matrix in time and figure out what these probabilities are. Right, so let's just plug in real numbers. So zero here, point one here. So model where I can go, I can I can't go from one to zero, but I can go from zero to one. Okay, a reversible model. And <coughs> for a branch of length TR, I can figure out what this rate would be and what this um, transition probabilities would be, right? And then I could plot that. So here as I change branch length, 
um, and I start branch in state um, zero, which is probably end in zero. Okay. And if I start in zero and take no time, of course, probably the ending in zero is one. That would be no time for change. And here we see that continuous time part, it sort of smoothly changes as time continues. And at this point, we're equally likely to be in state zero or state one at the end. Here, we're mostly being state one at the end. But I think this is irreversible. Once you're in state one, you stay in state one in this particular example I contrived. Okay. And so I could figure out what's the probability of going from zero to zero along this branch. Okay. And I can do the same thing for all these um, transitions. Right? And what you can do is figure out for this tree the probability of the seeing my idea at the tips, probably seeing 1, 1, 0, given that I start at 0 and have some rate matrix, is probably going from 0 to 0, probably going 0 to 1, probably going 0 to, sorry, 0 to 0, then 0 to 1, then 0 to 1, then 0 to 0. And I can try different states in here. And what I could try doing is see the probability of this tree, the probability of the data under this tree, right, where I have a 1 here. And so now what I could do is figure out, you know, how, how the probability of my overall data differ with a zero here or a one here, right? And that then becomes a way of figuring out essential states. So just figure out, you know, likelihood of having a one here versus zero here um, is, you know, 0.1 versus 0.02 or something. And so I have a lot more, lot more likelihood of seeing my observed data if there's a one here. Okay, you can do the same thing for all these nodes. Or I can compare different, different trees and say, Given I have the, these trees with these branch lengths, it's probably of my data under you know, tree one versus tree two. Right? So we have the same basic model of positioning from state to state that here I can use for estimating social states or I can use for comparing trees, which then becomes a tree search approach. Right? So this is sort of the big point here. It's from this basic model of these discrete traits that change over continuous time in a Markovian way, you know, where I go next depends on where I am only we get a whole variety of approaches. Right? So hypotheses about rates for single character. Are some rates equal? Are some rates set to zero? Are some bigger than others? Right? We can test that by constraining the trait matrix. Um, correlation between characters, right? If trait A in this matrix is actually trait zero, zero, and trait B is zero, one, and so forth, I can compare are the rates equal of transition when, when I think no matter what the first character is, or do they differ, um, that sort of question. I can infer a tree, so I can use this right matrix to figure out the probability of having, you know, A, B, B, A, A at my tips and try different trees and see which tree maximizes that likelihood. Right? So now I have a tree search approach. Or I can do a single state inference. I can say, given my tree, if I have an A at this node or a B at this node or a C at this node or a B at this node, what maximizes the likelihood of the data given this model? Right? So it's pretty amazing that with all these different, all, all these different questions, come down to the same basic model.